Okay. So I mentioned yesterday the, the name of the lab was British Imperialism Inquiry. This is that term that I asked you to kind of define in your own words at the end of your lab. And this term is one of the ones we come back to quite a bit in world history, and that is imperialism. Definitionally speaking, it is when a powerful nation takes over or imposes influence on a weaker nation for economic, political, or social reasons. One group dominating another. It's what we see the British doing in India, what we'll see other Europeans do in different parts of the world, in Asia and Africa and the Americas. It's something that colors and shapes the whole pantheon of world history particularly over the last several hundred years, when one group of humans begins to really start dominating much larger chunks of humans, most notably Europeans over parts of Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Imperialism is a term we will come back to, and it can take many different forms here. Note economic, political, or social. What's the map that you see up there? It should be kind of familiar to you, at least the basic contours of it. Yeah, it's the map of the British Empire that you saw yesterday, the one that the sun never sat on. And this is actually an early one. It doesn't uh, account for a lot of the interior of Africa that will eventually come under its grip. So what, have been the, what are the motives for, for doing this? What are the motives of going out and imperializing and, and taking over and building colonies throughout the world? Why do it? They're diverse, I want you to understand. Sometimes one is predominant over the other. Sometimes they come into conflict. Sometimes they're actually, uh, you know, uh, they work very well together. They're complementary. Number one, and you're probably most familiar with this one from U.S. History 1, because I know you talk about the European arrival and settlement of the Americas and the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, and the British, and Jamestown, and, you know, and Columbus, and, and uh, Cortez, and the Aztecs. I know that's, that's something you're familiar with. And that's the push for raw materials. You're going out to some other part of the world, a distant land, you're setting up a colony and you're trading with people, whether it's gold and silver, or maybe it's to farm some important uh, commodity like tobacco or cotton, sugar. Raw materials could motivate you. Could be the establishment of new industries. Maybe you can set up some sort of uh, construction or uh, manufacturing in a different part of the world. A lot of people would say imperialism for industry is still a big part of what goes on today, corporate imperialism, that many companies from uh, the United States or elsewhere in the world uh, go to different parts of the world solely for the source of industry. To get a labor force, a big part of imperialism is if you can't necessarily produce something in the mother country, but if you go somewhere else, you can not only produce that product, but you can get the labor of those people uh, to manufacture it and, and prepare it in some way, whether it's working sugarcane fields in the Caribbean or farming cotton in India, it's the labor force. Naval ports, there's kind of a strategic benefit to this. If you have a big navy or a big military, if you can establish ports and bases throughout the world, you can be strategically more, um, more powerful. You can strike from many different points. A place for your surplus population. I've always been drawn to this because it's, it's very interesting what gets people to go live in a colony and to carry out you know, the motives for imperialism. What do we mean by surplus population? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah, back there. Okay, yeah, people who, who just don't have a place in the mother country because they're, they, they had served time in prison and they can't really get a job. Any other idea for surplus population? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if, you're, if your population is overflowing, and, and even people in the upper classes are going to be kind of seen as surplus population, especially in Britain. If you're the second, third, or fourth son of a duke or earl or some sort of wealthy uh, merchant, and you're not going to get the family inheritance, you might want to go to a different part of the world, a different colony, to kind of make it on your own and build your own wealth. Uh, so that's going to draw people, as well as criminals and, and overpopulation and so forth. National prestige. Britain has to build an empire because France is building an empire, and the Germans are aspiring to build an empire, and Russia is expanding, so we've got to be careful of that. And the Americas just bought the Philippines, and there's all of this kind of swirling anticipation of, of countries growing big through the conquest of other lands. 
Also, there's this very racialized term that was used at the time, and I'm, I'm guessing some of you have heard it before. It's called the white man's burden. How many of you have just heard this term before? I'm not asking you to define it. It actually comes from a poem in the late 1800s, but it was this belief that white Europeans in particular were a superior civilization to what existed in Africa or Asia or other parts of the Americas, and it was the belief that with that superiority that they should go out and they were in fact justified to spread their civilization, which again they deemed as superior, and not only their civilization, their technology, but their religion as well, to spread Christianity. This was called the white man's burden. So I want to go back to beginnings here to show you how this uh, imperial project in India began for the British. This is the story that I didn't bring you up to speed on yet. This is how it actually begins. It's very slow, gradual, drip, drip, drip. The beginnings. It goes back to as early as 1600. You don't need to know the date, and you don't need to know the, the names here. But I just want to frame them so you have some chronology. 1600, the aging, very elderly Queen Elizabeth, daughter of Henry VIII, signs a royal charter a permission slip, essentially, to create a new joint stock company that investors in Britain could buy shares of. And they called this the British East India Company. I know from US1, you talked about the Virginia Company. That was another joint stock company that hoped to gain money, wealth, um, and produce in the Americas. Well, the British East India Company was like another one of those that comes into existence about the same time. The first ships, British ships, start arriving in India as early as 1608, right about the time the Jamestown colony is starting in North America, just for frame of reference. And it has a very weak presence. These are tiny trading ships from a recently created charter company, joint stock company, and they're showing up at Indian ports and they're running smack dab into the powerful Mughal Empire, which is at its peak. The Mughal Empire is interested in maybe trading, like they would trade with other peoples, but the idea that Britain is showing up and immediately taking over or overwhelming, that's not even close to happening. They're also competing, the British are, with other European nations. It's not immediately clear that India is going to be a British colony. The French are there. The Portuguese had been there for several, for several decades. The Dutch were there. There were many moving parts to this India trade situation. Several decades later, by 1660, King Charles II, don't need to know him, but he authorizes some increases to the East India Company's power, which still stays in business. It's making some money. But King Charles allows the East India some extraordinary powers. These would be effectively like the US government giving Apple or GE or some other company the powers of like doing its own currency or its own state. Some of these include can coin its own money. It can fight its own wars. It can hire its own troops. The East India Company can do all of this. It's essentially like Great Britain is configuring itself in a mini company that goes all over the world and does business as a way of gaining money for its investors. And I want to show you this vision because this will help kind of frame for you the chronology. I don't want people to get lost in the timeline. The Mughal Empire it's coming into existence and reaching its peak right around here. It doesn't go away. It's still a thing. It overlaps with the East India Company's arrival in Great Britain. And then later on, right about the time you saw that colored film footage that we started off with, that's when India is an official British colony. So when they said in that clip the British had been in India for nearly 200 years, that's what they're referring to. It's not until 1947 that India and Pakistan are going to get their independence. That's after World War II. That's something we're going to get to in the coming days. British presence in India, I want to stress this again so it's not lost upon anyone, is very gradualized. It doesn't happen quickly. It starts out very small. India and South Asia, just so you know, have long been a hub, a magnet for the spice trade. Europeans we're trying to get valuable spices from South Asia, from the what were called the East Indies at the time, the islands uh, 
that would constitute modern day Indonesia and Malaysia today. And Britain began this trading rate relationship with a much more powerful trading partner, the Mughal Empire, when they were at their peak. But conveniently for the British, right as they're ascending in power, they're growing in their power, the Mughal Empire, as Mr. Ellen Becker talked about, is declining in its power. By the early 1700s, remember this is the time of Aurangzeb and the right after the construction of the Taj Mahal. I'm sorry. Uh, they're going into their decline, which is convenient if you're trying to grow your presence and grow your trade and grow your wealth and build an empire. The East India Company does some things in India that makes them very attractive for the declining Mughal Empire. A lot of Indians think they're going to get something out of this too. That's why the relationship takes off. The East India Company, the EIC, offers supplies and offers trade and protection to many Indian landowners. Indian landowners that had existed within the Mughal system. And they now have this outside entity that offers them muskets, uh, trade revenue, other European manufactured goods, things from other parts of the world. And that seems pretty attractive. These Indian landowners have a name, and it's on your uh, unit objectives. I want you to be familiar with them. They're called zamindars. They're essentially like Indian nobility. Landed aristocrats <coughs> who inherit their land. They keep their land. They pay a tax to the government. Remember, they existed during the time of the Mughals. They start collecting taxes to pay the East India Company money to give them supplies and help them rule their peasant population. But for the average Indian peasant, they're only really interacting with their zamindar landlords, the Indian landlords who've ruled them for centuries. They're probably not interacting much with the British traders who give them supplies. Here's what I'd like you to do. So you can better appreciate the gradual nature of this, I'd like for you to watch this three minute clip from Ed Puzzle that I'm going to play. Your only task is to identify three contributing factors that allow the British to gradually get control of India. What allows them to gradually gain control? There's a Star Wars reference in here, if you can catch it. As the 18th century commenced, Europeans became increasingly involved in Indian affairs. They could afford to, because the Mughal Empire, which once ruled over not just the majority of India, but also parts of modern-day Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh was on the decline in the wake of very costly wars and conquests. The Mughals suffered from repeated invasions by Persians, Afghans, and other Indians. In 1739, the Mughal capital, Delhi, was sacked by the Persian ruler Nader Shah, following the decisive battle of Kut, and in 1748, Nader Shah's protege, the Afghan Ahmed Shah Durai, also led his armies into Mughal territory beginning his own invasion. Due to these factors, by the middle of the 18th century, the Mughal emperor took the role of a figurehead to many new and powerful local rulers. If you'd like to check out my video that goes into more detail about the Mughals, then follow the link in the description below. Thanks for joining us again, Hubbard. As the Mughals weakened, the Maratha kingdom in the central west of India was carving out an empire. Remember I said the Mughals were gradually losing control and becoming divided? You read about this yesterday? That's kind of a visual of it. So, Despite never eclipsing the Mughal Empire at its height, the Maratha Empire remained as a dominant power in India for another 80 years or so. As all of this was happening, the East India Company began to overshadow its European competitors, devoting substantial profits to raising a private army in an effort to contend with the Maratha Empire and to make all. By now, the East India Company benefited greatly from the country's imposing league, which enabled it to ferry more and more men to India than its European competitors. As much as the company's military aided in its growth, it was the laissez-faire policy that won over many local rulers to their side, many of whom benefited financially from their dealings with the company and did not perceive their sovereignty to be a risk. Of all the Europeans who had established themselves in India, the British and French based in the South were now preeminent. 
but under the daring Robert Pons, the British East India Company's army was able to defeat both the Bengalese and their French allies at the Battle of Plassey during the Seven Years' War, which, by the 1760s... The Seven Years' War was that broader global war that you guys would more recognize as the French and Indian War, the one between Great Britain and France and the Americas, also is going on simultaneously in India. Allowed them to assert control over much of the Indian subcontinent unchecked through direct territorial possession or indirect tributary arrangements. To quote Gardner once more, by the Treaty of Paris, 1763, the French forts taken by the company were returned to them, some of them having been raised to the ground. But the French never recovered and only six years later, the French East India Company collapsed, although the stations remained in the possession of France. During the British advance into the Indian heartland, it encountered staunch resistance from the Sikh Empire and other Indian states not interested in doing business with the English. The Duke of Wellington, who would later go on to defeat Napoleon, won several victories against these states, while aiding his brother, Richard Wellesley, who acted as Governor General of India. Consequently, by the turn of the 19th century, the Wellesley brothers had succeeded in leaving behind them the foundations of an empire greater even that of Akbar himself. There you go. As the middle of the 19th century drew closer, an Indian national consciousness began to take form, as company rule resulted in a wider array of social and economic reforms being demanded from increasingly alienated local rulers. These sentiments culminated in the Indian Rebellion of 1857, also known as the Sepoy Movement, which was brutally suppressed and concluded with the formal dissolution of the Mughal Empire and the transfer of power from the British East India Company to Britain itself. Power now rested in the hands of the British Crown directly. That's where we're going to stop. I'd like you to take a moment. I'd like to hear from a couple of you of some contributing factors that allowed the British to take control. What's one factor that helped them get a grip on a much bigger country when they started out in such a weak position? Jared. Okay. The Mughals were in decline and they were being invaded by outside empires, so they were having to fend off the Persians when the British were just starting to show up. Good point. What's another contributing factor? Something that helped the British get control. Yeah. What was the first part? Okay. Yeah, the British were growing right about the time the Mughals were declining. And you probably could have said that couple other variations of that. So the thing I wanted you to communicate that it was, it was gradual. I want to also make sure you understand this. This is something that's on your unit objectives. It's the way that the British exert their influence over the Indian subcontinent. It's called the Zamindari system, and it's on your unit objectives again. I want you to understand that the East India Company is sort of on the outside interacting with an already existing system. The East India Company, later the British government, collects fixed tax revenue and payments from what are called, what are, what are the Indian landlords called zamindars. The British think that, that this is actually a pretty efficient system because they're going to collect money from the local landlords, they're going to be able to rule through people that have always been there, and that they're going to be able to make money through their land and reinvest profits into their farms. The zamindars, who are the Indian nobility, the Indian landowners, collect rents from their peasants in kind of like a, um, a very feudal way, like you would have uh, nobles collecting rent from peasants. But they often fail to reinvest the revenue that they make into the land. Instead, they keep it for themselves, they build fabulous palaces, they live a zamindar lifestyle. The vast majority of the Indian population are not in the East India Company. They're not zamindars. They are a peasant population. They've been farming things like wheat and rice and cotton. And they work on these tenant farms that they may have worked for generations and generations. They pay their rents, and sometimes they have to take on debts. In many cases, they'll live life like sharecroppers, something you talked about in US 1, where you, you, you rent land with the hope of maybe one day owning it and saving up money 
but you don't make a lot of money, and if something goes wrong, you have to take on debt, and it's very difficult to escape that debt. So a lot of the Indian peasant population is locked in the bottom rungs of this society and can't go anywhere. Some of the costs of this are great. Because the East India Company is collecting money at the top and the Zamindars are living uh, kind of really uh, fabulous lifestyles in the middle, a lot of the Indian peasant population will experience a great number of famines, which are pretty consistent, especially during the late 1800s when something like 18 famines will take place in a series of 25 years. It's estimated, these are estimates, that somewhere around 26 million Indians are going to perish from famine just in this 25-year period. It's essentially like a Black Death type uh, experience being visited on India. I want to close with one big incident that kind of showcases Indian uh, discontent and anger with this system. By the mid-1800s, so this has been going on for a couple centuries, a lot of the native Indians start to awaken. And there's one particular incident where their anger overflows and is pushed back against the British. It's called the Sepoy Rebellion or the Sepoy Mutiny. Sometimes it's called the First Indian War of Independence because it was such a vast uprising. A sepoy, just so you know the terminology, which is on your duty guide, those are Indian people that are employed as soldiers in the British military. Paid soldiers that work for Britain. Hired soldiers, almost like mercenaries, if you've ever heard that term. They're outfitted with uniforms and muskets like you see here, muskets that would have been used like during the U.S. Civil War that required you to pour gunpowder in and to bite off the top of a, of a cartridge. You pour the gunpowder in, you put the, the ball in, you take the ramrod. That was kind of the sequence. You've seen that in film before. But the sepoys had cartridges that were greased in pork fat. And if you were a Muslim, as there, were, uh, there was a significant Muslim population in India, that would be religiously offensive to you. And it's this event, amongst the other mistreatment, that causes an uprising in 1857, where the actual Indian sepoys, the hired soldiers, revolt against the British. And there's atrocities on both sides. In fact, the British, when they eventually put this rebellion down, will crack down mercilessly. And there's these horrific stories about entire villages and cities um, being uh, depopulated, arrested, or relocated. The effects of this are that the British Crown realizes you can't have the whole country of India run by a private company. The East India Company has to lose its power. And in return, the British Crown, or the British government, will take complete control over India and start running the country as though it's part of the British Empire. Up to 1857, it was just the East India Company. After 1857, the empire itself is in charge. And it's like that footage you saw there at the beginning. This begins a period of direct British rule, and they call this direct British rule, this period in history, called the British, it's called the British Raj, which is a term Mr. Ellenbecker and I are going to pick up with on um, Tuesday. I just want to remind you, You've got that reading, that Socratic discussion for Wednesday, and you should be preparing yourself as well as for your map on Monday. Have a great weekend. Make smart choices.